All right, so this afternoon, um, I'm doing part five to He Opened His Mouth and Taught Them, so I'm preaching through the um, Sermon on the Mount again. Um, so if you guys can, we're in there uh, Matthew chapter six, if you can just go back to Matthew chapter five, starting in verse one. Matthew chapter five, starting there in verse one. I just want to remind us of a special note. Um, something we need to, I guess, be keeping in the back of our mind when we do go through the Sermon on the Mount. So it's Matthew chapter 5, starting in verse 1. It says, And seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain, and when he was set, his disciples came unto him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying... So again, remember, that, well, that's why I got the title of the sermon. He opened his mouth and taught them. But we see there that Jesus is speaking to multitudes. So a multitude is a group of people, but chudes, so it's plural. So there's different groups of people. And I guess from that, I think, you know, there's groups of saved people there. There's also groups of unsaved people there. Um, so that's something we need to think about. Um, now, what we're covering today, uh, we started there in Matthew chapter 6, verse 1. So it's going to be from verse 1 to verse 18. Verse 1 to verse 18. And, and I believe through reading the, through that there, brethren, that this is just to the saved amongst uh, the crowd there. Because we see the terms, you know, your father and thy father, when it's talking about arms and prayer and fasting. Um, so just a quick re recap, brethren, of, of Matthew 5, what we've already covered. Um, so Matthew chapter 5, verse 3, it says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. All right, so Matthew chapter 5, verse 3 through to verse 12 are the Beatitudes. So this, per this portion of the sermon uh, which Jesus preached sorry, is to both saved and unsaved, I believe. Uh, when I looked at the, the, the word Beatitude in the Webster's 1828 Dictionary, it said, uh, blessedness, felicity of the highest kind, consummate bliss, uh, the New Testament blessings and promises of God. Um, another thing there is that we've, we've covered already is that they're requiring faith. faith. Um, so then that was the first, first part that I went through there. Uh, but Matthew chapter 5, verse 13 says, this is the start of the second part, it says, Ye are the salt of the earth. And in verse 14 it says, Ye are... The light of the world, and this portion, I, I said, I believe, is to the saved. Uh, we talked about, you know, us being the salt of the earth um, and preserving souls through preaching the gospel. Yeah. And we also talked about being the light of the world, you know, walking in the spirit, but also exposing the darknesses of this world through preaching good doctrine and preaching the gospel as well. Uh, Matthew chapter 5, verse 17, this is the, the third part, brethren. Uh, Think not that I am come to destroy the law of the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Uh, and, and again, like I said there, I believe this is both to the saved and to the unsaved. Christ tells us that he came to fulfill the law, but he also tells us how we are to, to keep the law in light of the New Testament. Um, now, now again, I've said this every sermon, but I just want to say it again. Jesus is preaching in a time of great sickness. And we're in a time... Of great sickness. You see, brethren, with or without COVID-19, we are in a time of great sickness. I went and looked on, um, so it's cancel Australia, uh, ca sorry, cancel, canceraustralia.gov.au. So this is a government website. Um, and it looked at um, cancer and how, how much cancer has, I guess, developed over the years. So it said in 2016, there were 135,133 new cases of cancer diagnosed. And in 2020, says so this is last year, it says it is estimated that 145,483 new cases of cancer will be diagnosed in Australia. Now you say, well, what do they base that estimate on? Um, so then they look, so what they actually base that on is that um, they looked at studies like back in 1982 onwards and they saw how it progressed and how much, I guess, people were being diagnosed with cancer. It said the number of new cases of all cancer com cancers combined Diagnosed increased from 47,468 in 1982 to 135,133 in 2016. All right, so I guess they're basing it on that and they're doing uh, projections or whatever. Um, not only uh, uh, cancers and, and illnesses like this, brethren, um, we, we see in the world, you know, mental illnesses on the rise. And I, I took this from an, another government. Uh, but this is not, you know, uh, this is what the world's saying as well. It says in 2017, almost one in five people had a mental or behavioural condition and almost one in ten people had depression or feelings of depression. So the point I'm trying to make here, brethren, is that when Jesus preached the Sermon on the Mount, he was in a time of great sickness. 
And we are in a time of great sickness as well, whether it be cancer, whether it be you know, mental or spiritual. Um, so this sermon, I think, is relevant for today as it has been you know, throughout the ages. Now, this sermon today, like we, we've started in uh, Matthew chapter 6, and I've broken it up into three parts. So the first part will be when thou doest arms, from verse 1 to 4. The next part will be when ye pray, verses 5 through 15, and when ye fast. And that's verse 16, 17 and 18. And again, brethren, I believe this part is just for, for us, for those that have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, look at Matthew chapter 6, verse 1, please, brethren. Thanks for your patience there. Matthew chapter 6, verse 1. This part of title, When Thou Doest Arms. Matthew chapter 6, verse 1. I'm just going to have a quick drink. All right, Matthew chapter 6, verse 1. The Bible reads... Take heed that you do not your arms before men to be seen of them. Otherwise, ye have no reward of your Father which is in heaven. Now, we're going to look at the Webster's 1828 Dictionary at, the, at what arms meant. And it says, Anything given uh, gratuitously to relieve the poor as money, food, or clothing, otherwise called charity. Turn to Acts chapter 3, verse 1, please, brethren, because the Bible confirms this definition as well. Acts chapter 3, verse 1. So it'll be a few books um, along in, in the Word of God there. So Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts. Acts chapter 3, starting in verse 1. Because the Bible defines arms as, as similar to the dictionary there as well. Acts chapter 3 verse 1. Now Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour. So we see here, reading through Acts there, it's saying, you know, Peter and John are going to the temple to pray. Um, and I do believe, I'm, I could be wrong here, but I do believe that the ninth hour means from, from sunrise. So nine hours from sunrise, which would be roughly 6 a.m. sunrise. So this is at about 3 p.m. in the afternoon, roughly, I, I believe. So Acts chapter 3, uh, go to verse 2, please. So Peter and John are going to the temple at about 3 p.m. Acts chapter 2, uh, sorry, Acts chapter 3, verse 2. And a certain man lame from his mother's womb was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms of them that entered into the temple, who seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked an alms. So, so again, Peter and John are going to the temple to pray. And the, and the certain man lame from his mother's womb is, is sitting there because they carried him there you know, every morning, I think it said there, uh, daily at the gate, yeah. Um, and he's sitting at the gate of the temple and he's asking people for alms. Right? This is what he's asking for, alms specifically. Before Peter and John, you know, before seeing them come into the temple, and, and then he asks them also. So look at verse 4. And Peter fastened his eyes upon him with John said, look on us. So he's looking at the man lame. He's telling him, look on us. <clears throat> Sorry. And he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something of them. Then Peter said, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up. And immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. So again, we see there the certain man lame is asking for alms. And Peter says, silver and gold have I none. Okay? So showing that alms is money or a donation to the poor or to beggars. All right, let's go back to, to Matthew chapter 6, verse 1, please, brethren. Matthew chapter 6, verse 1. So we see alms is, is like money or, or, or donations or some form of charity to those that are you know, poor or, or beggars or, or in, a, in a worse case than what we are. So Matthew chapter 6, verse 1. So the Lord says, Take heed that ye do not your arms before men to be seen of them. Otherwise ye have no reward of your Father which is in heaven. So he said, take heed or, or pay attention that ye don't do your arms or charity in front of others because if you do, you have no reward of your Father. You have no reward from God. Go to verse 2, please, brethren. Verse 2 there, Matthew chapter 6, verse 2 says, Therefore, so for this reason, therefore, when thou doest thine arms... Do not sound a trumpet before thee as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets that they may have glory of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. See, the Lord says, do not sound a trumpet. Don't make a scene like the hypocrites if you're going to give alms unto the poor. Yeah, they have their reward, but their reward is only the glory of men. 
It's only the praise of men. We want to be, uh, have the glory of God and the praise of God and, and God's blessing upon us, not men. All right, verse 3. Verse 3. When thou doest alms, let not thy left hand know what thy right hand doeth. So he's saying, go to the extent that your left hand doesn't know what your right hand is doing. That's quite extreme, right? That's quite extreme. That's how secret he wants it to be. All right. So how can we apply this to our lives as Christians? Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, please, brethren. And we'll start there in verse 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 1. So how can we apply this um, as Christians, you know, doing arms in secrets, that our left hand doesn't know what our right hand is doing? So 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 1. First Corinthians chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God and Sosthenes, our brother, unto the church of God, keep that in your mind, which is at Corinth. So we see here Paul is writing this epistle to the church at Corinth, the church. Go to chapter 12, please, brethren, in 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. So 11 chapters forward there, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. The Bible says, Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. So, he's still, he's, so he is still writing here to the brethren at Corinth, the church at Corinth. Go to verse 4 of, of chapter 12 there, please, brethren. Verse 4 says, Now there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are the differences of administrations, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of operations, but it is the same God which worketh all in all, but the manifest manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. The same Spirit, the same Lord, the same God. Have a look down now at verse 12 of chapter 12. Verse 12 of 1 Corinthians chapter 12. It says, For as the body is one, and hath many members, and all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one Spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. So we see in terms here, the body hath many members, so also is Christ. Look at verse 15. Verse 15. If the foot shall say, because I am not the hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear shall say, because I am not the eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where were the smelling? But now hath God set members, every one of them, in the body, as it hath pleased him. And if they were all one member, where were the body? But now are they many members, yet but one body. So no member of the body is more important than the other. We're going to get to it here soon there in verse 27, but he's basically, the, what the body he's referring to here is the church. No member of the body is more important than the other. All members serve a purpose to the body. Amen. We need our mouth to preach the gospel, but we can't get to the door without feet. Amen? Amen. All right, go to verse 27. Now, now ye are the body. Of Christ and members in particular. So ye, brethren, the church is the body of Christ. And every one of us is a member of the body. See, we can't see salvations without soul winners. Alright? But that's it. I'm just speaking for myself here, brethren. I, like, I, I try to pride myself in going out soul winning as much as I can. You know, I'm not perfect, but I try. Um, but I have children. Okay? I wouldn't be able to get out there if my wife didn't stay back with the kids. Alright? So all members are important to get the work of God done. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right. All that to say this. All right. So going back to what I was talking about, you know, I mean, the left hand, right? All, right? all that to say this. One member of the church, one, one might represent the left hand. One might represent the right hand. Jesus said, let not thy left hand know what thy right hand doeth. We should rejoice in our... Like, this, is, this is not soul winning. We should rejoice in our efforts of soul winning. It's right and good to do that because it encourages and motivates each other. But, but given to a brother or sister in need, or even a beggar on the street, is something we should do in secret, is what God's saying here. We shouldn't even tell each other about our giving of alms. 
Why? Let's go back to verse 4 in Matthew chapter 6, verse 4. Why? Matthew chapter 6, verse 4. Let not thy left hand know what thy right hand doeth. Remember, we're the body of Christ. We're all different members. One might represent the left, one might represent the right. We shouldn't even let each other know when we're doing alms. Why? Matthew chapter 6, verse 4 says, That thine alms may be in secret, and thy Father, which seeth in secret himself, shall reward thee openly. We do our alms in secret, so God, not men, shall reward us openly. Let's go to Matthew chapter 6, verse 5, please, brethren, the next verse there. So when we do our alms, when we give to the poor, when we um, give to those in need, we do it in secret, even to the point we don't even let each other know. Matthew chapter 6, verse 5. And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are. For they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. Um, now, I looked in the, the Webster's 1828 Dictionary of a hypocrite, um, and it says, one who feigns or fakes to be what he is not, a dissembler, one who assumes a false appearance. Matthew chapter 23, verse 27 says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye are like unto whited sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness. God doesn't want us to stand up before unbelievers in the synagogues, in the corners of the streets and build out these long fake prayers is what he's saying here. All right, To make us look all holy or like the hypocrites. You say, but, but, but what about church, brother? We pray in front of others at church. Well, that's because church is full of believers. They aren't just believers on street corners. Synagogues aren't full of believers. 1 John chapter 2, verse 23 says, Whosoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father. The word pray, remember he says pray. The word pray means ask. We see the phrase, I pray thee, you know, throughout scripture. I pray thee, I pray thee. And it's, and it's, and it's someone in the Bible asking someone of something of someone else. When someone is asking something of another. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 18, verse 19. Because I want to address, you know, the question might come up. Well, what about in church? We you know, pray together in church. We pray in front of others. In church, go to Matthew chapter 18, verse 19, please, brethren. The Bible permits this. We are to pray with each other amongst ourselves as believers. As believers. Matthew chapter 18, verse 19. Again, I say unto you that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they ask or pray, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of these. So the Bible saying here, if two shall agree and ask or pray, it shall be done for them. In verse 20 it says two or three. All right? So more than two, three. It's for brethren. We can pray together. It's okay to pray in the midst of brethren. We shouldn't be building out, but, but you know, like I said, we shouldn't be building out prayers that are going longer than the sermon. All right, um, unless it's a prayer meeting of some sort, but it's okay to pray in the midst of brethren. Um, you know, someone might, might say just to be, you know, just to push it a little bit further. But brother, what about the hymn "Sweet Hour of Prayer"? Sweet Hour of Prayer. All right, we'll go back to Matthew chapter six, verse six. The Lord tells us how we do these sweet hours of prayer. Matthew chapter six, verse six. Matthew chapter six, starting in verse six. Uh, the Lord says. But thou, remember he's talking to the saved, he's talking to children of God. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet. And when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy father which is in secret. And thy father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. So again, we see here that the sweet hour of prayer should be in secret. And Jesus gives an extreme example saying, you know, he says, go into your closet, your cupboard, and shut the door. You know, now, look, if I can be honest with you, brethren, I, I struggle with, with the long prayers. You know, sometimes I'm sitting there, you know, I'm going to pray for an hour, half an hour, and I'm kneeling there, you know, I'm thinking there, I've been there for about, you know, 50 minutes. I look down, it's about five, ten minutes. Um, but, but either way, whether long or short, we should, we should make the time to pray in secret. We should make the time to pray in secret to our Heavenly Father. Um, go to verse 7 there, brethren. Matthew chapter 6, verse 7. 
It says, but when you pray, use not vain repetitions. Use not vain repetitions as the heathen do. For they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. All right. So the Lord's saying we shouldn't only find a secret place. We should also be thoughtful about our prayer. You know, quality prayers, not, not quantity or, or numbers or, or huge amounts. Clear and to the point, not beating around the bush. God wants our heart to be in our prayer, not words read from a script. Amen? Amen. Amen. Go to verse 8. Matthew chapter 6, verse 8. The Bible reads, Be not ye therefore like unto them, for your Father knoweth what things ye have need of before ye ask him. Yes, we give praise and glory unto God when we kneel before him in prayer. But, but I'm sure you'd agree that there's a point where it can be a bit excessive. You know, someone's saying, there, Oh, Heavenly Father, Son of Father, uh, God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. You know, you're like, you know, he knows you're talking to him, all right? Just acknowledge him, but, but just don't overboard. I think he's saying, Don't ramble. Um, kind of like what I'm doing now. Uh, Matthew chapter 6, verse 9. Verse 9 there, brethren. Um, After this manner, therefore pray ye, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. So now Christ is starting to get into the, the manner or, or structure of, of, of our prayers. Now now look, if you can recite the Lord's, word, the Lord's prayer thoughtfully, you know, thoughtfully, thinking about what you're saying, you know, praise God, that, that's a really beautiful prayer. But you notice Jesus didn't say, after these words, therefore pray ye. No, no, he said, after this manner, Therefore pray ye. What does manner mean? What does the word manner mean? Um, I looked this one up in the dictionary there as well. Uh, it says, form, this is what manner means. Form, method or way of performing or executing a peculiar way or carriage, a way or a mode. So Jesus is teaching us the way to pray uh, or how to pray, not, not what to pray. Does that make sense? All right, um, verse 9 then. Go back to verse 9. Matthew chapter 6, verse 9. It says, after this manner, therefore, pray ye, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. So you know, I guess from that we could say, we could say you know, our Father, which art in heaven. Or you know, we could say something like Heavenly Father. You know, I'd, I'd say Heavenly Father myself. Or Father. You know, basically acknowledge God in your prayer, is what he's saying. Verse 9, uh, the back end of verse 9 there, it says, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Hallowed be thy name. So... You know, don't take it overboard, but have a bit of reverence for your heavenly Father. Amen. Exodus chapter 20 verse 12 says, Honour thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Like you're not going to kneel there and say, Heavenly Father, you know, Papa G, sitting up there in your third heaven crib, you know. <laughs> that's, you're speaking to the creator of heaven and earth, right. your heavenly Father. Have a bit of reverence, have a bit of respect. All right, looking at verse 10 there, brethren. Verse 10. Matthew chapter 6, verse 10. So acknowledge your heavenly Father. Have reverence for your heavenly Father when you're praying. Matthew chapter 6, verse 10. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. So he's saying before we pray, asking ourselves the, we should be asking ourselves the questions, right? Before we pray. Um, this is what I'm saying. It says, is what I'm asking for bringing forth his kingdom? Or is what I'm asking for fulfilling his will? Is what I'm asking for going to help me walk my Christian walk? Or is it going to help me get out there and preach the gospel? So when we're praying, we should be thinking about what's going to help us be better children of God, be better Christians. As well, Matthew chapter 4, verse 17 says, From that time Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, Mark chapter 1, verse 15 defines what it means to repent for the kingdom of heaven. It says, And saying, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. Repent or turn from trusting in yourself to trusting in the finished work of Jesus Christ. You To get to... To get you to the kingdom of heaven, to get you to the kingdom of God, by just turning from your unbelief to belief. Go to verse 11, please, brethren. Matthew chapter 6, verse 11. So when we're praying, we should be thinking about his kingdom or his will for our life um, on this side of, of heaven. Matthew chapter 6, verse 11. 
give us this day. This day, not this week, this month, this year. Give us this day, our daily bread. Now, I'm sure most, if not all of us here, have you know, a full cupboard or enough food to survive. Praise the Lord. But let's not think it's, all, it's, not, let's not think it's always going to be like that, though. Remember when COVID-19 hit? The stores were getting a bit empty there, eh? Let us ask our daily bread from our Heavenly Father, our daily food from our Heavenly Father. Go to verse 12, please, brethren. Um, we're still looking at how the Lord is, is, the way the Lord is teaching us how to pray, what things we should consider when we're praying. Matthew chapter 6, verse 12. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Now, he didn't tell us to ask, forgive us our debts, full stop. <laughs> he said, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Sometimes we need to forgive to be forgiven from our Heavenly Father. Our Heavenly Father. Remember the servant who owed 10,000 talents in the last sermon? Yeah. He wasn't very forgiving. He, he wasn't forgiven because he wasn't forgiving. Okay? Go to verse 13, please, brethren. Matthew chapter 6, verse 13. So, so try to have a, a forgiving heart towards our brethren and, and, and others when we're praying as well. When we ask our Father to forgive us of our sins, we sin every day. Matthew chapter 6, verse 13. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom. Not mine, thine. Talking about the Father. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The kingdom is God's. Even when the Jews try to get rid of Christ to take the kingdom for themselves, God rose him from the dead. Amen. The power is God's. Even when Satan persecuted Job, he had to ask God for permission. You read that. And the glory is God's, even though we put in the work to go soul wing, it's by faith on his word, souls are saved. Amen? 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6. I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. Go to Matthew chapter 6, verse 14, brethren. Matthew chapter 6, verse 14. Matthew chapter 6, verse 14. For if ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will, for, will also forgive you. See, we might, look, we might like to look back at verse 12, what we just read there in terms of the prayer, and say, well, well that only has to do with money. We should just forgive people who owe us money. You know, debts, debtors, whatever. But, well, verse 14 is talking about forgiving trespasses or sins against you. Against you. If there's one thing I look, just speak for myself here, brethren. Um, if there's one thing I hate as a father, right? It's, it's when my children offend or irritate the other. Okay. But that said, I also hate it when my children fight and argue. It works both ways. See, at some point in your Christian walk, you're going to contend or argue with a brother or sister in Christ. And if not, you're going to get offended or irritated by something someone does or says. Ch look, Church is made up of different peoples and nations, brethren. Different peoples and nations, different cultures, different backgrounds or, backgrounds or traditions that aren't Christian. You think we're all just going to change our bad habits or sin once we're saved? Isn't that that false doctrine of lordship salvation? We're all growing constantly every day, and if we're not reading our Bible, we're not going to grow. Patience with one another. Peace with one another. Matthew chapter 6, verse 15 says, But if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Now, someone might argue here because, you know, I've been on the other side of being offended. Well, Proverbs 18, 19 says, A brother offended is harder to be won than a strong city, and their contentions are like the bars of a castle. It's, tr it's true. It's in the Word of God. All right? But the Word of God also says within 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 12 to 13, be a peace among yourselves. Be a peace among yourselves. Go to Matthew chapter 18, verse 21, please, brethren. Matthew chapter 18, verse 21. Matthew chapter 18, starting in verse 21. 
Matthew chapter 18, verse 21. Then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? To seven times? Now the Lord's just finished talking about agreeing with one another in, in, that, in that chapter there. And Peter thinking about, I guess, offences between brethren. He asks, how many times shall I forgive a brother that offends me? Before suggests, so he makes his own suggestion and says seven times. Verse 22, Matthew 18, verse 22. Jesus saith unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until seventy times seven. Now, when, when I first read, started reading the Bible, brethren, I'm looking at it, I thought he said seventy-seven times. But you look what he's saying, he's saying seventy times seven. He's saying four hundred and ninety times we should forgive each other. Now, now we can keep track of seven offences, but good luck keeping the track of four hundred and ninety offences against you. Don't we sin against God every day, brethren? Yeah. And doesn't he forgive us of our sins and trespasses? Yeah. We should forgive one another. First John chapter 4, verse 11. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. One another. Go to math, back to Matthew chapter 6, verse 16, please, brethren. Matthew chapter 6, verse 16. This is the, the third part, when ye fast. So, we, so the Lord told us, um, about you know when we when we do alms when we give to, give unto the poor or those in need when we uh, pray how to pray how we should pray what way we should pray and this is when you fast so how we should fast all right Matthew chapter six verse sixteen he said moreover when ye fast be not as the hypocrites of a sad countenance. For they disfigure their faces that they may appear unto men to fast. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. Now when I look, I looked in the dictionary at the word fast, um, and it said, you know, literally set, stopped, fixed, or pressed close to abstain from food. And we know that from the Bible, it means to abstain from food. Second Samuel chapter 12 verse 21. Then said his servants unto him, so he's talking to David here. What thing is this that thou hast done? Thou didst fast. And weep for the child while it was alive. But when the child was dead, thou didst rise and eat. So while the child was alive, David holds a fast. But when the child died, when the child died, then he ate. So the difference there. So fasting is opposite to eating. Esther uh, chapter four verse sixteen. Go gather together all the Jews that are present in Shushan and fast ye for me, and neither eat nor drink three days, night or day. So again, um, we see there in, in verse sixteen. Uh, Matthew chapter 6, verse 16. God doesn't want us to, to do this in front of others like hypocrites. How? You know, having a sad face or, you know, showing discomfort or disfiguring your faces. You know, like, oh, man, I'm starving. He doesn't want us to do that. You know, yeah, people are going to feel sorry for you. You're going to get your reward of men, but not from God. You're going to get it from God. He says, how? Uh, so, yeah, okay. Uh, now, again, because, again, if you're fasting in this way, like I said, your reward's not going to be from God. It's going to be from men. Go to verse 17. Matthew chapter 6, verse 17. So this is when we fast. This is when we fast. He says, But thou, when thou fastest, anoint thine head and wash thy face. God's saying when we fast, we should wash our face, put, put oil or, or ointment on our head. Why? Why is he saying this? Go to uh, verse 18. Matthew chapter 6, verse 18. That thou appear not unto men to fast, but unto thy Father which is in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. Again, God the Son is teaching us to fast in secret, so God the Father can reward us openly. Now, when we, we recall like the, the, the Beatitudes, you know, back in, in Matthew chapter 5, we notice that it took, took a pretty high level of faith, yeah, to accept the promises of the blessing what Jesus was saying back there in 5. But, but even so with this portion of Christ's sermon, God is telling us to do these things in secret to be rewarded openly. But doesn't a natural man think like, um, how am I going to be rewarded openly if no one's, no one's going to see me? Yeah? Do, you, do you see how these promises are also by faith as well? Like the Sermon on the Mount, it requires faith to accept what the Lord's saying. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1 says, Now faith is... The substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. 
2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 18, For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not, uh, which, which are not seen are eternal. And in Matthew chapter 16, verse 27, it says, For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he shall reward every man according to his works. So we might not see rewards for our good deeds now, brethren, on this earth and in this life. But when Jesus returns, he will reward us openly. Every eye shall see and every ear shall hear. The saved which have done nothing for Christ will go to heaven to the empty mansions. But the saved who labor in the gospel and in the ministry will have power over many cities. Amen? Amen. To finish up, my brethren, can we please go back to Matthew chapter 6, verse 2? I want to make a point here about what we learnt um, in, in, in this portion of the sermon. Matthew chapter 6, verse 2. Listen to the words. Pay attention. I think he said, take heed. Matthew chapter 6, verse 2. Therefore, when thou doest thine arms... Please go down to verse 5, please, brethren. Matthew chapter 6, verse 5. And when thou prayest... Go down to verse 16, please, brethren. Drop down to verse 16. Matthew chapter 6, verse 16. Moreover, when ye fast... You notice Christ didn't say if, but when. If means something, if just means something we might do. When means it's expected. Yeah. Fasting is expected in the Christian life. Praying is expected in the Christian life. And giving alms is expected in the Christian life. Now, now praise God we're in a church that fasts when we're going through tough times. And, and we're also in a church that prays every service and we pray for each other. But let me ask you a tough question. When's the last time you gave money to a beggar? And remember, the Bible says, thou, not ye. So this can't be the responsibility of the church. This is the responsibility of each Christian. You say, ah, oh, but brother, we live in a wealthy nation. They can just go to on Centrelink, all these beggars, all these homeless. Oh, true. Is Centrelink a saved Christian? Was Jesus talking to Centrelink back here? Go to Revelation chapter 13, verse 15, please, brethren. Revelation chapter 13, verse 15. Revelation chapter 13, verse 15. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. Now, we've, we've studied prophecy and revelation, that kind of thing, brethren. This is about the Antichrist and his coming kingdom. And we see here, we can see he's going to kill anyone that doesn't worship the image of the beast. He's pretty much going to send us to heaven early. All right? But... When you read passages like Matthew 10, 12, uh, sorry, Matthew chapter 10, verse 22, and 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 17, you can look at them in your own time. Matthew 10, 22, 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 17. There's an indication that some of the saved will survive until the coming of Christ. That's after the Antichrist on the scene. Go to verse 16. Revelation chapter 13, verse 16. And he calleth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand, or in their foreheads. Now the saved can't receive this mark because in order to receive the mark, you have to worship the image of the beast. Not only that, brethren, the Bible says those who take the mark will be heard of the second death. But we who have believed can't be heard of the second death. Revelation chapter 2 verse 11 says, He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. And when you go to 1 John chapter 5, it says, If you believe that Jesus is the Christ and that Jesus is the Son of God, you believe the gospel there, you are of them that overcometh. Faith is the victory that overcometh the world. Amen. Amen. Now verse 17. So we're still in, should be in Revelation verse 17. Revelation, um, I think it's chapter, was it chapter 13? Verse 17. Yep. It says, And that no man might buy or sell save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. All right. All that to say this, brethren. Like, I don't know, I've got to study, I don't know exactly when the Antichrist will institute the mark of the beast. 
But I do have a feeling it could, it, it might be, I, I don't know, it might be at the beginning of the Great Tribulation. Now, I may be wrong, but if this is the case, let's say this is the case, isn't it possible we could, there, there could be a time where we might be those beggars on the street? Or those in need of food? It's possible. Finishing up, let's go to Matthew chapter 7, verse 24. Matthew chapter 7, verse 24. And we said, when you do alms, when you pray, when you fast. Matthew chapter 7, verse 24. Therefore, this is the Lord speaking, Whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat upon that house and it fell not for it was founded upon a rock. And everyone that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat upon that house and it fell for and great was the fall of it. Let's pray.